Hey, glad to be here. I'm Evan Weaver, CEO and founder of Fauna. Unlike all you all, I do make money from Jamstack. So <laughs> I'm going to tell you why Jamstack is great and talk specifically about data for Jamstack and some of the challenges that need to be solved to enable this, this new stack, this new development methodology. Um, but with myself, as a more of a you know, old school developer who grew up in the, the 90s and the O's, um, had to learn in, in order to catch up with the cool kids as we were delivering Fauna, the serverless database, to market. So, and please stop me with questions, complaints, arguments. Um, happy to keep it conversational. I'm going to briefly cover, you know, what Jamstack is and how it impacts the data layer. GraphQL, how that interfaces with Jamstack and you know, the stacks you may already be using, like the mean stack and full stack applications. And then FaunaDB specifically, and why FaunaDB is the database built for serverless, and why that's so great for Jamstack. The fundamental premise of Jamstack to me is that you get to simplify your your server-side application, mostly by eliminating the server side as much as humanly possible. And to represent what's happening in a Jamstack application, we're going to start with you know this little guy that we call Mr. Request. So our, our little request has a job to do. Its job is to go from the browser, which you know currently is Chrome, but probably not for long to some kind of asset which is hosted off the local machine. If you're running completely locally, it's all good. You know, you can get a text file, see your information, remember what you forgot, and that's the end of the story. But if you're trying to distribute some data to some other people who are not you, who are not physically in your presence, then you need something on the server. And right now, the server side is represented by this bucket, which we'll imagine is an S3 bucket. So it has some static information. So our browser sends a request. The request maybe carries some user data over, gets to the bucket. The bucket says, I don't care what your data is. I serve the same thing every time. It gets back to the web page. Back to the browser. We render it. And that was pretty cool. But what if we actually want to act on that user data? So then we need something that can execute logic on the, app on the server side. And the popular choice for that logic is Node.js and JavaScript. This is sort of the, the mean stack model. And I can talk a little bit more detail about how these, these models have evolved. But you know, this is kind of, I think, the standard these days. You know, JavaScript is the most popular language. It's the most popular front and back end language. It's great for writing dynamic applications. Maybe not that great for writing a database, but you know, we all learn that the hard way. Um, there are plenty of frameworks that will help you bundle your server-side logic together into a, a full stack or a mean step ap application that's running on Node.js as a runtime and it's hosted someplace, a server, a container, a VPS, all the usual stuff you're familiar with. So we send our little request along. Gets to the back end. Now the back end wants to think about it. So now a request is waiting. Eventually, the back end is done thinking, sends the request back with, with the page, we get to render it. So while the, while the request was waiting, what was really going on behind the scenes? Well, typically in a full stack application, we're talking to a bunch of APIs and a bunch of databases. All of these have to return to the request or return to the full stack app, and then the app, the app returns to the request before we can return the page back to the browser. We'll wait a little bit. We'll send some sub-requests that happen internally, usually within a single data center, but sometimes not. If you're going to an API, you may go as so far as to query California from Boston, have the California server query a different server in Boston, and you wait for it to return to California, and then send the request back to you. Well, you knew that data was down the street, but you couldn't get it, so you had to wait. Here we have our API coming back. 
we have a database query coming back. You're lucky if you only do one database query within the request. So you're probably going back and forth some more. But for illustration purposes, we'll jump back. We'll construct the HTML page. Give it back to the request. Send the request back to the browser. Oh good, we rendered something. <laughs> this model is pretty old. You know, the original dynamic, you know, dynamic server-side application stack was principally C with custom network drivers. If you had a physical machine, it probably lived in a closet somewhere. If you tripped over the wire, it would, it would turn off, someone would go plug it back in. It's all good to go because you had about one user per minute. So maybe they didn't notice that the, the server was down while the wire was being plugged back in. You know, we, we upgraded this with a variety of technologies. PHP, which is um, an upgrade in usability, but not else, but I like it all the same. Perl, CGI, then other things that made it a little bit easier to spin up the server that could answer multiple requests. As we progressed to the 2000s, we had technology on the Microsoft side, stuff like ASP.NET, usually backed by RDBMS, <coughs> specifically SQL Server. The application lived on one machine, potentially multiple applications on one machine with J2EE and servlets and all that good stuff. Everyone was writing code behinds and they liked it. We were, no one laughed at that joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, controllers is what you might know them by. Um, on the, the open source or the LAMP side, we had, we had Java, Ruby, Rails, Python, Django, all kinds of stuff, still querying the RDBMS. And then we got an upgrade in the 2000s to the beginnings of the serverless model. And some of the original serverless frameworks, like serverless.com, for example, as well as um, others which are either cloud-hosted or, or locally managed, are principally oriented around delivering a traditional full stack application into the serverless application runtime. AWS Lambda or Google Cloud Functions, Azure Cloud Functions, something like that. And what this does is it, it splits out the, the server side compute into, into multiple. <laughs> <laughs> Hold it closer and speak louder, let's try that. So the principal innovation of serverless in terms of, does the angle make a difference? Better? Worse? Better? All right, I think that's the main issue there. All right. <laughs> so the principal issue, or innovation of serverless in terms of the, the application itself, is that the compute is no longer contained in a single machine metaphor, a VM, a container, a physical machine. Raise the mic. Higher? To speak into it. Here. Yes. Not here. Here. Yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so the principal innovation of serverless, as far as the compute here goes, is you're no longer beholden to the physical machine metaphor. Maybe you are for your development in terms of you know, your shipping, a container is something that has one function in it and still is a POSIX interface. But you're not beholden to it in terms of the physical resources. The concurrency problem, which plagued us in the full stack and mean stack days, is solved. And that, that's been an improvement in the life of, of our request. Because we can send one request to one Lambda, or one compute server side function, and get back an answer immediately. And concurrently to that, we can send another request to another lambda and get back a different answer for some other part of the page. And that means these things can happen in parallel, which they could happen sort of parallel in the full stack era, but they can now happen completely parallel from the perspective of the client, in this case the browser, but it could also be a mobile app or something else. And the typical job of the lambda in this scenario is to authenticate the request because these backend services usually do not have authentication or identity built in. So they can't be directly exposed to the internet. And to perform some business logic that may be easier to calculate server-side than, than client-side. 
And this means that on the, on the client side, we're not really taking the HTML page and rendering it directly. We're using JavaScript, which executes some logic server side, which you're intimately familiar with, to compose these responses into the final result, which is then rendered by the browser or the mobile app to the user. And that's where the Jamstack comes in, because instead of hitting the back end to get your, your business logic all composed at once, and then returning it to the browser, either as a JSON you know, a JSON object to be rendered if you're in a mean stack world, or is the fully computed page to be rendered only by the browser without logic if you're in the, the full stack world. We now have logic occurring on, on, the, on the client side to compose the, the individual objects into the final result, which is then rendered by the browser. So that, that JavaScript, which is executed in the client, is principally served statically. You know, we, we drive a static bundle into the browser. It can update the URI and do other things to make it act just like a dynamic web page. But it's actually querying the back end, the back end interfaces over APIs. And to me, the, the reason we call it APIs and not just requests or databases or something like that is mostly because these have to be public. And an API kind of implies that the, the data is publicly available, or at least the endpoint is publicly accessible. Authentication happens out of band from, for example, the network, which is principally how we secured the back end and the, the full stack days. You know, if you were in executing logic on the server side, you'd access to everything more or less. Now, there's still some issues in this model. <clears throat> one, one issue is that setting up Lambda is actually kind of painful. There's a lot of operational overhead you have to go through to secure it, to make sure it's exposed, especially exposed in multiple regions, to integrate it into your application development lifecycle. One, one of the innovations recently in one of our partners is Netlify, which you may, you may have used, especially for static site deployment. And Netlify's job is principally to ease the delivery of the static assets to the browser. So you can use a Git-based workflow to deploy your, your app, your Jamstack app, to Netlify. You can also configure Lambdas in Netlify, which are backed by AWS Lambda behind the scenes. And that will make it easier for you to spin up your end-to-end -end app in a context which assumes those Lambdas are publicly available, that the application is principally delivering a bundle to the browser, which then executes logic directly, and otherwise fits the Jamstack model. We like this model because it lets the request do its job faster, specifically do it with lower latency. By pushing the concurrency to the browser of the embedded client, we get to have the best case scenario in terms of the responsiveness of the back end instead of the worst case, because we're not sitting around waiting for each individual sub-request to come back before we can decide to present something from the user. Jamstack also solves a problem, especially in the, the compute side, problem of scaling. The concurrency is, is not only an improvement for latency, but it's an improvement for the scalability of the back end. Because more logic is pushed to the client. So if you have more clients running, you have more compute resources available, scal scalably by definition, you know, able to process their own work, and also to issue more concurrent requests with, with less bottlenecking to the back end. Especially in a Lambda context, if you can scale your serverless layer, um, if you can scale your compute layer serverlessly, then you don't have to worry about the resources which are available for the compute tier. You're not bound by a single physical machine. You don't have to orchestrate anything, even for auto scaling, to try to guess at the concurrency of your backend or your predicted load, because every request is is, is every request is provisioning transiently its own compute engine, executing the request on the back end in the Lambda context. If you set up Lambdas in a global context, it executes it globally from the Lambda, which is nearest to you, and returns that result to the user. So that on-demand on scaling is really useful when we have some kind of surge event. So say we build our wonderful Node app, it uses the mean stack, it queries some APIs, like maybe it hits the Chewy.com API and it also hits Mongo to store some data. 
about the cat food. Cat food is what I buy from Jerry, but you probably buy something else. Um, stores, it stores the cat food you purchased in, you know, in a Mongo database. And now this, this app is really popular. Chewy tweeted about it. Everyone's talking about it. Everyone's signing up for their cat food tracking app. And we have lots of clients sending lots of requests. We're bottlenecked on concurrency if we have a, a full stack application. But if we move to a, if we move to a serverless application, we can scale out these lambdas and exactly match the concurrency of the incoming requests and the incoming usage. And that kind of sums up Jamstack up until this point. The next frontier for Jamstack specifically is data. And if you have full, if you have full board concurrency um, from the from the client, from the embedded applications, through the compute tier to the back end, the place that you bottleneck up is going to be the data tier. And we're going to take a brief detour to talk about GraphQL and how people typically query the data tier in a Jamstack context. Um, but let me take a pause for questions before that. Can you hear? How about question number one? Better? Worse? Probably not worse. Maybe better. What was that? Can you hear in the back? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Any questions about Jamstack specifically? How many of you are already building Jamstack apps? Not, not too many, okay. Mean stack, mostly? Full stack? How many of you are using GraphQL? One thing you may have noticed about Jamstack is that if you're pushing everything over to APIs, you have to have some kind of definition for what those APIs are. And GraphQL originally arose to solve this problem in a slightly different context. GraphQL was initially, initially spec'd by Facebook to essentially create a common intermediate specification language for data that embedded applications, specifically the website, Facebook, Facebook mobile app, Facebook Messenger, and that kind of thing, needed to get from their back end. If you remember from the, the full stack era, which many of us are still in, you know, you principally do this by defining REST APIs. Those APIs essentially return one style of response for one particular part of data from one, one specific back end application or container. The problem with this in an application which has grown in scale, not necessarily scale in usage, but scale in functionality, is that it makes it very difficult to change what those APIs are or what the data is without breaking everything. If your mobile developers, for example, want to add another feature, they have to somehow get another REST API added to expose that specific data in a format they can consume. They then have to start querying that concurrently with all their other requests, they can end up in a world somewhat similar to the, the previous world where they're issuing too many concurrent requests, having too many bottlenecks, especially from a mobile application, and performance starts to degrade. Another problem is that the back-end developers building the services, which are you know, data services themselves composing other services, need to be very careful about how they version their API so that they don't break running clients. You can't always control in an embedded client, in an embedded context, what clients are actually running either. You can't force your users to upgrade their app. You can't even force them to refresh their browser um, if they've had a tab open for a long time. Maybe hitting you with the old version of your application, and you have to figure out some way to present all possible versions of your, your data set to that application in a scalable way. Well, that's essentially the problem that GraphQL solves presents all possible versions of your data 
to your embedded clients, which can now decide how they want that data to be presented to them. So I'll run through a quick example of how GraphQL is defined. It's not specifically a, a piece of software or technology so much as a specification for essentially structs and for interfaces for how the structs are queried. So if you go back to our, our 1995 model with C, you had all kinds of structs in your application which you were executing you know, in Apache if you were lucky. Um, now you have them specified in a, in a specific language which is exposed over JSON for consumption by the embedded clients and, mobile and browser clients. So in this example we're going to set up two structs or, or two object types, cars and users. We're going to set up a relation between the cars and users. And all this is is a specification that can be consumed by back-end and front-end software. It sets the contract between what the back end is willing to serve and what the front end knows how to query. So we'll set up a user type. We'll give it an optional, an optional field named username, which is typed as a string. We'll give it a mandatory relation to the car type, which we'll define next. I guess you can have no name, but still own a car, which is fine. Um, the relationship is what we care about. So. <laughs> Anonymous car ownership is valid in this particular graph. <laughs> Our car type has a mandatory plate, so you must register it even though you might not be yourself on the grid as far as the government is concerned. <laughs> it also must have a user relationship. So just to clarify, this API cannot handle Steve Jobs' car. Did he, he, not he, he was he, he famously never never had the license plate in. Yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> but he also parked in the handicap space. So <laughs> is that related to the lack of the plate? Okay, so, <laughs> so 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 we're in agreement that whatever Steve Jobs get, gets Jobs gets out of this API, he deserves it. <laughs> <laughs> I think he had a special rest API. It was probably the next step API. All right, <laughs> These are our two types. You've seen types before. Every language has classes or prototypes in JavaScript's case. TypeScript is like kind of doing its own thing, so we won't really talk about that. But um, these two types now can be related by a query, which essentially sets up the endpoint or the interface for querying a, a car by its plate. Now, there's no specific logic specified here for how to actually do this. The expectation is that the backend developers will use some framework, which makes this easier in their specific language, to, to fulfill this contract. At the same time, the front-end developers or the mobile developers will take their, their, their own language stacks, use whatever GraphQL query libraries, or directly implement these, these endpoints by hand, knowing what the, the resolvers are going to return based on this contract. Now, one thing that, that would be really nice if we, it would be if we can set up behind the scenes how this actually works without having to encode it directly. And that specifically is what PhonoDB's GraphQL support does. We'll talk about PhonoDB next. As far as GraphQL goes, PhonoDB offers a native GraphQL interface that lets you upload the specification and will automatically define within the database the resolvers and the types necessary to fulfill it. So you can then hit the database directly from your embedded or browser clients and get back data that fits this contract. We have a slightly more advanced example of a of a mutation here in GraphQL. This is another another endpoint similar to a resolver which lets you do modifications. It's defined in a similar way except it has a little bit of population logic here and metadata to fill out the rest of the interface. Another example of, of finding a car. Um, 
we can talk about that more later if you're interested, but we'll pop ahead. So that this this particular this particular example kind of shows not I, not I would say the primary power of GraphQL in terms of composing multiple data sets and multiple interfaces into a single uniform one, but at least the standardization and the specification that allows you to create when you're trying to define an interface that you can expose to clients which you, you no longer control because you would